there was a time when industrial revolution happened and there was a great gathering of global minds to find out what are the faults with it and what can be an alternative way of economy. But when we find this technology now going to the levels which is you know, sort of unprecedented and we don't capture it right now in its full uh, bloom, do you think that there is a need of some alternative thinking on economy, on politics, so that at least we have a synthesis of sorts or do you think that it is a competing capitalism now and the alternative opinions, they have no scope? No, alternative has always existed. In fact, mainstream has thrived, <clears throat> survived, grown, evolved, changed because of the either the internal contradictions or the alternatives that were in play at that point of time. I think when you talk about industrial revolution, I think that probably is not even one hundredth of what we are seeing today. It's a world that we have <clears throat> yet to comprehend. Exactly. That's in terms in it of... It is enormity. Yeah, it is just enormous. I mean, you know, industrial revolutions or the earlier uh, systemic breaks have changed societies, have changed economies. Today, you are changing individuals. Besides changing the economies and the societies and stuff, so we are at the threshold of a time when we probably the human mind will get forced to actually start looking and trying to comprehend the extent of the non-human reality. Uh, you'll probably today have a system whereby the human mind will feel inferior to what is happening around, unless of course the reserves of the human mind expand and that is where the story will lie. You, it's not just an opportunity today in terms of what we are seeing, whether it's the AI revolution and how it is changing economies, societies, individuals and everything. It's not only about that. It's an opportunity, of course, but it also perhaps is the biggest challenge that the human race faces today, which actually break, is breaking down or threatening to break down the boundaries. Those are geographical, political, emotional, social, whichever boundaries you have are being redefined. We are in some ways going back to the past, but with a different era altogether. We are today, let's say, if I talk about the economy, yes, I'm a little more familiar with that. We are today talking of shared economies, which is what it started off with. So it has evolved to go back to its roots, but in a very different way. So I think the biggest human challenge today is to A, comprehend the enormity of it, see it as a challenge as well as an opportunity. Opportunity, of course, everybody is seeing it, but see it as a challenge to overcome and result in a better human being because today, to my mind, the human race is under threat. When this is the scale of the threat and extent of the threat, and in fact, the United Nations has also realized it, which is a, a global reflection of the anxieties deep down on what to do with this artificial intelligence. Uh, isn't it, uh, you know, um, I, I think uh, there isn't any alternative to it that somewhere human mind has to get ready and to be combative uh, against these th threats. But if you have a person like uh, you know Trump as a character, that's not as a person, when he says he comes to the power and the first thing he'll do is that he will throw the uh, people who are not there legally in America, he'll throw them out, see the Mexicans. And if this becomes the priority and not the sustainability, not the climate challenge, not the conflict is that they have given birth around the world, is it a, a, a kind of a degeneration in the global leadership? Because there is a tendency for us uh, as human beings to glorify the past. Always has been there. You look at Kashmir. You tend to see the leaders of the past as being huge leaders. They live, the they live in the past. Similarly, if, if you yourself just think for a moment uh, of the best cricketers you have seen, they will never be the present cricketers. They'll always be in the past. So, in a sense, it's a reflection of that. But to make a larger point in, um, in terms of degeneration of leadership, it's about the ambit of what now is called leadership. You know, um, the way we are now valuing leaders. So, it's not the problem with the leader. It's the problem with the, the people. Follower. The follower. And that is, if you were to come to Kashmir from the US, you are seeing the same thing. 
that it's not about what the qualities of a leader should have, but what the people want. And today, in today's environment, there is very little appetite for a deep thinking intellectual. The Platonian, you know, leadership of the intellectual doesn't exist. Not because it's not required, but because it is not needed. And your people who actually has it lost the attraction. It has lost for, for the people. And do you, do you think sometimes when you reflect uh, um, in your own solitude that all these names, the philosophers of recent past and the distant past, and the ideas that they gave to the mankind, it's a sort of maybe a poetry of sorts that one can enjoy with one own self. But uh, with our new generation, they don't receive it. They don't understand it, and they don't have the appetite to have it. And if that is the case. What is the obligation for this generation now? How do, how do we make it attractive for them? How do we make it understandable for them? Again, a very profound question. It's about, uh, I feel it all the time, that you know there was a certain joy, an unadulterated joy of going to a bookshop and finding a book that you didn't expect. And then and I remember very, very vividly, it was 1984 or 85, yeah, when I first saw a book by Foucault and it literally was fireworks of the mind. It opened up a new vista for you. You had never seen that. You never thought of it. And suddenly you find this whole thing getting... Uh, I don't see that joy in, in... I'm sure there are books which will excite people in today's... even in today's world, even for AI, people are doing it. Uh, you know, the whole new area of cyber psychology has come in doing so much in terms of trying to understand how the same person is different people on different social platforms. You are one person on Instagram, you are one person on Twitter, you are, so there's a schizophrenia of the generation. And in that you have lost the appetite to absorb, assimilate, and the world is moving so fast that you are now reduced to writing a 140 word tweet. What it also has done, and which I think is the most profound thing, is how intellectualism has been democratized. It is no longer a prerogative of the educated. When else he is a PhD and he has done this and he is a professor in... No, a random person on the street will tweet 40, 140 words and it picked up everywhere. And it may be as banal as whatever else, but nobody cares. He is on the same platform that your most profound intellectual of, uh, let's say today, the most pu well-recognized public intellectual of India, uh, Pratap Banu Mehta, is on the same platform. So you and I are at the same level, right? Now that has caused a certain dissonance in the system and that is what we need to address. Do we create these parallel platforms? How do we do that way? Sensible of Musk to do what he did with Twitter because you're also seeing a certain dynamic emerge. It's not a free-for-all. You align with me, I will let you do certain things. You don't. I will not. Then is it a challenge for the intellectuals, quote unquote, to go to another level? They work very hard Absolutely. now. So this usual stuff, it doesn't work anymore. People are familiar with it and they can do it themselves. Absolutely. So this um, discussion can be endless. But coming back to uh, your uh, time in JNK Bank, not into the economy, but you try to create a different kind of symbolism around JNK Bank. I remember the logo, the colors of it. When you now look back and you look at the, uh, the, you know, the logo of the same bank, the colors are still there, but the code is missing. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, and I, uh, you know, it was an intervention. I always thought that JK Bank is an institution, perhaps the biggest institution of the civil society. And it was done by the Maharaja in 1938. It somehow had lost its way somewhere in the commerce. So I tried to pull it back to connect with the DNA of Kashmir. Of course, on lending side, we did a massive program of lending in JNK, not outside. That is not worthwhile for me doing that. But also as a vehicle for bringing about cultural change, whether through a calendar or I always saw this giving a loan to somebody is giving him a sense of dignity and a certain value. I will give a loan to an auto guy. He actually feels very privileged. So it's not so much about a commerce, it's all about identity. And that the uh, bank owes it to him. Yes. Because the state, forget the state, that owns the bank. What to me was very significant JK Bank was the emotional equity invested by the civil society. That was the core. 
somewhere that had been lost so my contribution to jnk bank in that sense was to revive that connect and say it's not about financial equity it's about emotional equity and the returns of that will come because you have a loyal customer with the result that jnk bank was overwhelming i mean you had 90% market share so how did it matter but the way it would transact and the way i redesigned the branches and the way did as you said the logo trying to integrate it everything almost everything yeah, almost that everything. Was, the diaries your calendars that's right. That's right. Even the branches that you did, right. so, so it was, it was writ large everywhere. Yes. everywhere. And you know, I, I tried to integrate the whole cultural space of Sufists and you know, a thing of how one kind of the shrines of the of the shawls and the artisans. We devised products, artisanal product, carpet weavers product. Because I was trying to also make JK Bank an intermediary. It's a financial intermediary. What does a bank do? You put your money in it. He lends it to me as a you are a saver. I am investor. But I was taking it beyond that. I was making a part of that and trying to replace the intermediary. It happened in horticulture. It happened in crafts. Both these things. So typically, the horticulture was from Delhi. So I took a view. I said, I will fund you. And it happened by pure chance. And let me share this anecdote with you. I was reviewing a branch in Azadpur, and I suddenly saw the overdraft was very high. So I said, Why is the overdraft very high? Who is borrowing at these rates at 16%, 17%? So I said, no, there are these uh, commission agents. So I said, who are they lending it to? They're lending to Kashmir. So I said, why don't I lend? At 12%, at 6%, because it was all, the, it brought about a huge thing. And I had a delegation from the Fruit Commission Agent Association saying, you are, you are killing our livelihood. And we'll, you know, we'll disengage. I said, you disengage, I don't care. I am going to, it's not your job. Finance is my job. So I tried to integrate it with the society and the production system of Kashmir. That was the contribution. Did it any time you went into the deeper political spaces of India, that symbolism which you created, which was, uh, which had a slant also, very open, it was Kashmir specific. Uh, did it any time, you know, uh, was seen as a kind of a mild irritation among the people outside Kashmir? That not really, not really. Because in Bombay and in Delhi and other parts, we had created our own space. I think it was uh, done prior to when I was there. There was a certain amount of um, regulatory forbearance, saying, are you increasing your concentration risk? And I reacted very harsh on that. I remember it's on the records of JNK Bank. I got a letter from whatever the regulators and said, you know, your concentration risk and whatever. So I reacted very harshly on it, but never after that. Um, no, I didn't find any resistance of that. The, in fact, I had discussed in, the, in that time in the government of India with at the highest level uh, that I want to make it the uh, Bank of Silk Route, go to Central Asia, you know, take it there. We had uh, three branches. We had three branch licenses for uh, POK. So I had kind of engaged with the government saying that why don't I open that? Because this is the soft power of JNK getting into those regions. Because at, they don't at the moment, it looks like a dream. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. But I know there are times when I have shared with people that what I wrote as finance minister or as JK Benchim, if I read it today, it will be seen as pure subversion, right? But that was, yeah. Those so, were the times. Th those were the times. So one was engaged with that level of uh, you know, activity and trying to do certain things to resolve it and make it helpful. But then, you know, it became a barter trade back again. It went into its own thing. Now it's been stopped or whatever. But those were the kind of expanses one was getting the bank into, yes. But did not feel a resentment at all at any point. Two, two, two more responses from you before we close it. One is uh, on the uh, side of the jobs. I remember once you said that um, the, the uh, actual space for us to uh, get into is services, not the industry. We have a great scope if we get it in the services. Now that we have uh, information technology with us, uh, how do you find, uh, can the you know, jobless people in Kashmir, can we think of expanding the service sector? and offer services to the outside world. What is the scope of that? And what kind of skills do we need to impart at the school level in the colleges so that uh, we can get more jobs? You know, honestly, it is a no-brainer. Today, I'm of the view, post is sustainability change, because when you were talking of 2010, it was not sustainability. You have two sectors, horticulture and crafts. Both are sustainable. India. So by default, we have an advantage. Yes. India is the fifth largest producer of apples in the world. Kashmir on its own is the sixth largest. If we double, and today our yield is 11 tons per hectare, global average is 44. If I take it to 22, if I take it to 22, India becomes the second largest producer of apples 
and with one fourth the area that China and America have. Why am I doing anything else? Sustainable, regenerative, spread across all the things. Organic, rural areas, organic ownership, no issue at all. And which is where I had done that initiative to get a, to a dry port. We lack a port. Logistics, that's what I tried. Didn't, didn't succeed. That is one. Second is crafts. Just go back in time. Every single color of your paper mache is organic. Every single thread of yours is organic. Today, JNK, or I'll speak only about Kashmir Valley. Kashmir Valley can be the ESG capital of India. So what stops us from I that? have no idea. I have written about it. I have talked to people in power saying, I don't want industry. What? Why do I have these steel plants and cement plants and medicines and all that now? Can you just focus? And if, if you remember the package that I had worked on with uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, first term, 80,000 crores, 5,000 crores was for horticulture, converting it to high density and you know, bringing it up. It is, it is doing well. Similarly, you need a craft package. Today, we have 14 lakh small household enterprises. On an average, they employ two people. That is a thais lakh low. If you take two, give some technology, some design, and some finance, raise it to four, there is no job problem. Why I had started a chair in the university, and my logic was, typically you'll expect a bank to have a finance chair. I said no. University should have I, it. University should have a MBA in horticulture chair. How many people can JK Bank absorb? Why do I need finance here? If you give me MBAs in horticulture, MBAs in craft management, I will elevate my business. Today, my every business has a problem of stunting. It goes up. What, do you have a single listed company in India? No, only JK Bank. Why not? So how do I scale that? If you do that, follow that principle, that I want to create a supply of things that I need, MBA in horticulture management. I have a farm of 100 canals of land. I will employ a manager who is you know, well paid, comes with a nice tie, suit, whatever, and runs it as a profession, right? So that, I think that's where I would take the thing now, suggest that, you know, let's look at it from that ESG perspective. Of course, there's a huge tourist sector, service sector, which is organic to your own growth and, you know, it's related to your shawl sales and good sales and all that. So that within the amber service sector, you create these pockets of growth and regeneration, which will actually help the country achieve a certain degree of resilience. In the thing. Otherwise, the $5 trillion dream, how do I contribute to that dream? To that end, um, would you, you know, uh, sort of find a kind of, uh, you know, an interest being here and guiding the next generation on all these technical things on how they can take this economy a notch up, how they can create this employment for themselves and live lives that are very decent and economically very rewarding. Can you, uh, you know, sort of commit yourself to, to uh, sort of uh, a social, I won't say activism, but being an active player in changing the minds of our youngsters? So, in my own growth, because I moved out and I do my own work wherever, for whatever it's worth, one thing is for sure that I will not engage with government. I'm not looking for a government job. Much as may people may want to think that you know I'm trying to look for a job, I'm not looking for a job. It's not my interest. I certainly don't want to get into politics for sure. You're not you're you're not going to do a, a job now. You're not going to get back into the politics no. now. So. But at a personal so level, doors are closed. Yes, I have shut those doors. I don't want to do because it, it gave me a lot of grief and gave me no joy. I had a lot of joy as economic advisor, a lot of joy as chairman JK Bank, no joy as finance minister. But what I am doing today is within my own circle of friends. I have a I have a good desire and an interest in mentoring, which I do even outside of uh, JNK. Uh, I mentor people, entrepreneurs, whatever. In, in, so in some, in a private network, uh, I do mentor a few people who have done very well. Uh, I take a lot of pride in what they do and there are quite a few of them hanging around here. I don't want to name any of them, but they're doing well. Now the question you're asking me is that should I scale this up into a slightly more institutionalized form? Where it didn't? I'd be very happy to do it. Uh, I will have some commitments for the current year and maybe, you know, uh, a few months more. Then I do, at the end of it, I do want to come back and spend uh, some amount of time in GNK doing some bit of writing, some bit of uh, creative thinking. Recently, there were two bereavements here. One was uh, the known who was in politics then, the earlier the business, Devinder Singh Rana. 
you know, when he passed away, though he was uh, in the adversarial camp for the National Conference, but we could see that the National Conference leadership in a very humane way, you know, articulated their grief. There was a second incident that happened, which was the death of the uncle of uh, Mirwais, uh, Umar Farooq, and Farooq Saab went uh, and, uh, you know, for the condolences. Do you think that this is somehow significant to our society, that no matter what our differences are, political, economic, historical, but at least we must have that grace that in our human sufferings we are all one, united, and we must express that unity and harmony of us being humans. How do you rate it? How do I you was, respond? Uh, I was honestly very happy to see how, I'm not talking about national conference because they will follow the leader. The real initiative At least the person. Came, at this point of time came from Omar Abdullah. I was extremely graceful of him. Perhaps he was too personally close to Rana, though he had been quote unquote betrayed. But we are, we know friends, we have friends, we have differences with them, but at the end of the day they are friends. I think it was a wonderful gesture to see. I'm not so sure if it's a societal norm now. The society post social media has become very toxic and it's either, you know, it's an either or situation. There is an element of grace which probably will die with the generation of Farooq Abdullah. I don't see the same being transmitted down the line. Um, I, in fact, wrote in the last column I wrote for G, uh, GK, the politics has become so personal that it doesn't behoove a decent human being to actually be there. So it is in some ways very much a Kashmiri tradition to do that. But we have lost it in the noise somewhere around that. And if this kind of an effort, this kind of an initiative or a pure gesture helps revive that, nothing better than that. So I would imagine that this is one element which again needs to be revived, reinterpreted and followed which will result in a better, at least all that you want at the end of the day. I'm asking myself and I ask, ask everybody to look at what are you looking for at the end of the day. There should be a certain happy society around you which you can contribute to. The larger political troubles notwithstanding, everybody should have that space and that grace to allow that. And in whatever way we can contribute, we must do that. And compliments to Farooq Saab and, and both of us to do that. It sets, it sets an example. Exactly. exactly. So though it is a very sad note that we don't see any prospect for that at the societal level and uh, these things, you know, uh, actually impacting the younger minds. But nevertheless, it can be opposed to the posterity that they let them think about yes. it and let them that recover that grace. And maybe people of this generation can uh, work relentlessly to uh, retrieve that, restore that grace, because grace is not a constitutional uh, status. status. Grace is something which comes from Absolutely. you and me from within. Thank you very much for this candid and honest and very interesting discussion. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.